All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Alexis here, uh, basically the president of the internet, I think, uh, based on uh, what some folks were, uh, never were saying elected. on Twitter. I was never elected. <laughs> They're teasing me because of a Forbes article from way back where they said mayor of the internet. Mayor. It's better Not to be the president. president. Not president, just just a humble mayor uh, of the internet. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let's um let's just jump in uh, to the background. Obviously, uh, I think people in tech know uh, the story of Reddit and all that, but uh, lots of people listening don't know that story. So maybe let's start with kind of where you grew up and uh, and how'd you get to uh, Reddit. Sure. Uh, I mean, I was a I was a history major at the University of Virginia back in 2005, and I was getting ready. I was taking the LSAT actually. And I walked out uh, 30 minutes into it because I was hungry for waffles. And I went to the Waffle House on Route 29 in Charlottesville, Virginia, was sitting there eating my waffles instead of taking the LSAT. And I realized I should probably not be a lawyer. And, and with that, realized I needed to do something and, and started kicking around some ideas I'd had for starting a company and convinced my roommate uh, to quit his job in order to come work with me. Uh, for some indefinite period of time working on some ill-defined thing without any sources of, of real revenue guaranteed. We were going to like consult on the side. I, I managed to convince him. His mom was pissed, uh, but I convinced him to turn down the job offer. And then we were lucky enough to be in Boston on our senior year spring break. Uh, while everyone else was going down to Mexico, we went to go hear Paul Graham give a talk called How to Start a Startup. And Paul Graham would go on to start Y Combinator, and invited us basically, you know, we, I, I approached him after that talk and said, Hey, I want to pitch you on this idea. We came all the way up from Virginia and he said, sure. And he met us for coffee, pitched him on this idea. It was a way to order food from your phone. It was 2005. Uh, but the whole idea is you could skip the line, but you don't have a smartphone in 2005. You just had text messaging and it was, it was a lot of ugly hacks, but um, he saw enough potential to then launch Y Combinator encouraged us to apply. Uh, we got rejected. Uh, which sucked because he we just had a great conversation with him. And then, then the next morning he called back and, and I was like, hello. And he's like, look, we still don't like your idea. And I'm like, dude, why did you call me back to say that? Like, that's not, that's not helpful at all. And he said, but we'd like you to. And if you're willing to change your idea, we'll fund you. And I was like, I need to think about that because you got to play it cool in that situation. And I was like, okay, I'll call you back. And, and we were convinced. We were like somewhere in Connecticut. We got off the train. We got rid of the old idea, which was called My Mobile Menu or mm, and and called them back. And I was like, we will accept your offer. And back then it was, I think it was $12,000 was how much YC gave you to start a company in 2005, which was amazing for us. And we got to work. Uh, and that is what became Reddit. Uh, in that first meeting, when we took the check, Paul said, don't build anything that involves a phone right now. Um, and he was right about that. It was too early. Um, but he said, build something in a browser that solves your problem every day. And he said, what do you do every day? And, and for me, it was, I'd open Firefox, which was a big deal, open a bunch of tabs and, and just read a ton of different content. And, uh, and that wasn't very efficient. And, and he actually asked us, he asked us if we'd ever used delicious. And this was a social bookmarking site, basically Pinterest without pictures. If, if, if Yahoo acquired them pretty early, it was all text-based, very programmer focused, but it was people bookmarking interesting links. And so back then it was like tips for Ruby on Rails and, and those would get bookmarked and the most popular bookmarks would surface on a page called delicious slash popular. And that was we had never used it before. And, and he said, take a look at this. And he was like, what do you think about this? And we were like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Like maybe there's a, there's a there there. We know opening, starting your day with a bunch of tabs wasn't the right move. Um, and there could not be a front page for the internet in the way that there was a front page of say the New York times. And that was something I, I give credit to Paul for phrasing. He was like, that's it. He crystallized on it, build the front page of the internet. Um, he screwed a lot of other things up. Like he tried to talk me out of the name and the mascot uh, and commenting. Uh, but thankfully we didn't listen to those, those tidbits. Uh, but, but he nailed it with front page of the internet. And that's what we sought out to build in 2005. We sold it in 2006 to Con and asked, which at the time felt like I was winning the lottery. Like we were working for 16 months and it was a $10 million exit, which was life-changing it was more money than my parents had made their entire lives and i worked for 16 months on this thing like in my underwear 
Like that's, that's broken. But, but in 2006, we just didn't know, we didn't have the advisors. This was the impetus. I mean, really the impetus for Gary and I to do initialized was to be the early stage investors that we wished we had had when we were in the trenches um, so that we could avoid a lot of those or founders, future founders could avoid the mistakes we made. And, you know, I went on, I, I wrote a book, I helped launch Hitmonk. I was a partner Y Combinator and then started initialized uh, with Gary to do this kind of early stage investing and, and then got the chance to come back to Reddit in 2014 uh, when it was in you know, pretty dire straits um, as executive chairman and helped lead the turnaround for the next like three years, four years. And, um, you know, Reddit's gone on to raise funding, hundreds of employees doing really well now. And I moved back into the board role, a uh, board only role, so I could go back to initialized full time, which is what I'm doing today. So awesome. that's my life in uh, you know, 10 minutes. <laughs> I love it. Uh, most people don't know this. I don't even think you know this. Uh, we are actually uh, small investors, but investors through an SPV in, uh, in Reddit um, when you guys did the, uh, the turnaround uh, round. Oh, so. great. The first outside. Great. Oh, yeah, good, big, good on you, man. Big, uh, big, big fan. Um, but it, right in on. terms of when you, uh, the Condé Nast, and, and when you guys sold the company the first time, yeah. uh, I think this is like a, a classic situation where founders are like, holy shit, I built this thing and somebody's going to buy it from me? Like, how dumb are they? It was stupid. Right? Yeah, it was just, it was stupid. And we didn't, I mean, I cannot stress this enough. And I've, I've never really told this stuff um, publicly. It was, you know, every startup is dysfunctional in its own way. There's always a million fires and, and you're always just sort of triaging and prioritizing best you can. And we were not far into Reddit's life. And we launched it in June and then less than a year later, I remember in April, because my birthday is in April, um, I, was, I was in touch with the head of a BD, business development for Khan and Ass, this guy, Karosh Karam Khani, who had reached out because we had a mutual friend who said, hey, you should check out this Reddit thing. And, uh, and he was making overtures about potentially working together an acquisition. And, and at the time, we just weren't, we weren't making any progress uh, shipping new features the site was just still growing kind of miraculously. And, and, and overall, like the advice we were getting from our investors was, oh my God, that could be an acquisition offer. Like go pursue it. And, and I was basically told like your best bet, Alexis, is to get this company sold. And I mean, we, we had not raised much money at all after YC demo day, we raised uh, 70 grand, I think. 60 grand. So we, 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 we thought that was a ton. We actually turned down an offer to raise, uh, I guess it would be a seed round of a million dollars back in 05 after demo day. We turned it down because we said, we don't need that much money because we weren't even thinking about like hiring people. It mm -hmm. was so dumb. And, and so we didn't have much money, but it was fine. Our burn rate was super low and, and we were not doing any of the right things to actually grow a business. And here was this offer. Our investor explicitly was like, Alexis, go try to get, get anything you yeah. can. Um, I was actually able to reach out to, and eventually we worked our way up at WPNI, so Washington Post Newsweek Interactive. And we actually got really close to an acquisition offer by them. Um, but they would not match Condé Nast's exorbitant price. And, and so we ended up going with Condé. And, and yeah, it seems bonkers to me for 16 months worth of work for a company that really wasn't shipping any code for the last few months um, would, would be able to get acquired, but they saw potential credit to like Steve Newhouse, Karosh, um, the ones who ultimately did the deal kind of asked, like they saw the potential, even when we, the founders who were closest to it didn't. And uh, you know, kudos. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that I got a second chance. Um, and a lot of founders who sell early don't get that. So I know I can, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that, but this is exactly the kind of thing we, we, we want to help founders with during these early days uh, that we just didn't get when Gary and I were starting. As, yeah. As at, at some point, did you have almost like seller's remorse? Like, like when did it hit you? You're like, shit, we might not, we, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Uh, so no, yes and no. Like my rational brain probably uh, by 2000. 10 or 11 once so i stepped away in 2010 um february of 2010 and i went to go went to go to armenia went to go to the motherland to go volunteer for kiva for a few months and and around that point i just thought you know what like 
all things considered, uh, this, this site keeps growing and it's probably worth more today uh, than it was back then. And then it really clicked by like 2012 where I was like, oh my God, this thing is still growing and like nothing has changed. Like there's no business, especially in tech, that should be able to get away with not evolving. And yet it did, right? Reddit didn't have a mobile app until 2015. We launched the mobile app and it was a big, like it, it was steering the Titanic over to make mobile a priority, whether it was mobile web or Android and iOS. Um, but we did it and, and it was like credit to all the folks who got it done. But it, once I realized that, like, wow, this thing just kept growing because the community, because we got just enough right in the product, just enough right. And then the community really did everything to sustain it and grow it. That's when I was like, oh, geez, wow, that we really messed this up. But my, my, my rational, that rational brain usually gets drowned out by the, I guess it's the more rational or the more stoic part of my brain, which is like, look, everything you've had from this point of selling it happened because you sold it then. And so look at all the amazing doors that opened to you. Look at all the amazing things that happened to you. And yeah, it'd be a different timeline, but uh, like I'm pretty, pretty happy with, with how things are, uh, quite happy with how things are. And so I've just tried to look forward from it and obviously learn from it and know that it was a mistake, but not dwell, not dwell on it. I just, I've, I've tried to always live my life looking forward that way to the best of my ability. And so I think part of it's just being delusional, but, uh, just trying to have that 24 hour memory and, and keep, keep, keep going forward. That's what makes it fun. Uh, when'd you meet Gary? Uh, I met Gary when he, applied to Y Combinator in 2008 or nine. Um, he was applying with his company Posterous, uh, which was, so back then it was a Marvel cause you didn't really have smart, you didn't have smartphones. I don't think then, or you were just starting to. And so you had phones with these really good cameras on them, um, but it was a pain in the butt to get uh, the photos off and, or there was no app store. That's what it was. Yes. So there's no app store really developed yet. No ecosystem for that. And it was just coming on. And so you could easily take a bunch of photos and then email them to an address, an email address, and magically a, a photo blog would appear. And it was really clever software. Um, I, I gave him a thumbs up. So he continued into YC. And, uh, and then he became a founder while I was a kind of advisor there. And, uh, and then within a couple of years, he had sold to Twitter and was back at YC as a partner uh, and then I was sort of back in the orbit as like a part-time partner and then eventually a partner at YC. And, uh, you know, I ultimately, I, I could have been a partner sooner at YC and, and Paul and Jessica very graciously offered. Um, but I think you'll appreciate this. I said, I didn't want to leave New York and <laughs> like, I just didn't want to be in the Bay area for, for that extended period of time. Now here I am in Florida. So I, you know, I still, I got, I got, pulled out of the city, but, but my heart is still very much East coast at least. And I, I spent time working alongside Gary and a bunch of the other partners working with, you know, accepting and then supporting YC companies for a number of batches and was just like, was just, was floored by how decent and thoughtful Gary was as well as bright and hardworking and all those other things, but like incredibly decent and thoughtful and how much great founders gravitated to that. Uh, especially in the Bay area where there's just so much bullshit. And, and I actually think it is, it's such a superpower, not just because it is rare, which already makes it valuable. Um, but also because it attracts the right kind of founders and, and it's provided us this amazing orbit of just high quality, just great individuals uh, that we get to help build companies with. Yeah. When you guys decided that you were going to go and, uh, and start initialize and kind of invest together outside of YC, uh, like what was that conversation like? Did one of you kind of propose to the other one or, or like asking out on a first date or what was that like? You know, it was, it was not very deliberate. Um, we were, we were both. So all the YC partners at the time, and I think still this day were angel investing. So like, you know, they write a small check to the companies at the end of the batch they liked and, we were doing this, we were doing it pretty well. And, um, someone approached, I think it was Gary or actually might've been Harge, um, and said, Hey, would you take like my money, uh, to invest in addition to your own? And, and we were like, huh? 
And he was like, yeah, like you can write pretty small checks, no offense, because, you know, you, you sold so early. Uh, but like if you, if you take other people's money, uh, you can write bigger checks and, and start to have even more of an impact helping these companies and, and maybe even build something greater than just you all angel investing. And, uh, and then, I don't know, we must have been having drinks one night or something, and it, and it came up, and, and I, I, I said, yeah, that sounds great. What a good deal. And, and really, the first two funds of Initialized were um, basically just an extension of our angel investing. And then it wasn't until Fund 3, which we launched in it was 14 or 15, that it was like formalized, like, okay, we're going to take real institutional money. We're going to, we have this team. Uh, we're going to build software to actually run the firm um, and really do it like deliberately, sort of modern initialized, as I call it. I didn't start until then. Yeah, I, I always love the, uh, the, that switch or that decision to go from, hey, I took like my friend's money to uh, the institutions, a uh, whole different ball game. And uh, yes. I think that there's a lot of fund managers that uh, don't build the software, they don't build the systems. And then they're like, wait a minute, you want a report like every quarter and you want like to know how much money you have with us? Um, like, oh, gets, that's really <laughs> it gets real. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like we have such an inherent advantage just because as founders, we are product people. And so we're, I mean, even to this day, only a few years in, we'll look at anything that comes up that we have to do that is repetitive, that is sort of tedious. Um, and that becomes top of mind on the product roadmap for things that we can either automate or build software to do so that we can better spend our time and our team's time doing the things that humans are really good at so that we let the software do the, the other stuff. Um, and it's not like it's a black box where it's like, tell us to invest. It's like, remember all these things. It's like manage the deal flow, generate the reports. Like this is tedious work that humans suck at, that humans shouldn't be doing. And if a partner wastes a minute of her day doing, like that's a minute that's not helping the firm actually make money. And that's, that's what we want software doing. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. What um, what, what makes kind of the partnership work? I, I think a lot of people realize like you, Gary, some of the other partners, like you guys are very supportive of each other, both publicly and, and obviously seem to have like a very strong relationship. Outside a bromance. Of you're, you're referring to the, the bromance. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what makes that work? Uh, huh, what makes the bromance work? Well, you know, hard conversations, uh, being able to, and this is the thing, this is why we're so long on coaching generally, mm. executive coaching, I mean, everything, coaching, therapy, like all things, exercise of the mind and relationships, uh, something we, we try to prioritize and really speak and live those truths ourselves. I mean, as well as physically too. Um, that maintenance mentally and physically is so important. And a big part of that isn't just personal, it's also interpersonal. And it takes work, just like any relationship takes work, whether it's romantic or professional, like that, it's, it's an investment. We have uh, two on two sessions, Gary and I do with our coaches um, regularly, uh, at least quarterly, um, just to review all the other mini sort of one-on-ones that Gary and I try to regularly have, and as well as one-on-ones with our respective coaches. Um, and so one, it's acknowledging that it's all a work in progress. And I think the, the big takeaway that we look for in founders now and really push them on early, early, early is so you have to have the complementary skill set. And that's the tried and true, like, of course, yeah, this founder does this and this one does that. We're complementary. But the, the next level of that in questioning is, is actually looking for where or how much the Venn diagram overlaps when it comes to things like values and worldview. And, and that is a thing where I've, I've had founder relationships. I've, I've been very close to a lot of founder relationships and portfolio companies where you see that breakdown on the long-term values. And, and that, that starts to, I think that is the core problem that, uh, that only services later during the harder times. And, you know, during the early times, the good times, you know, growth solves all problems. You don't really, it doesn't really come up, but the hard times when they come up, when they, and they always will, um, is what services when there's those value worldview differences. And it's not to say one is better or worse, but if you don't have alignment on those things that matter, I think that is where a lot of the tension, like that's where things start to tear. And so I'm fortunate because Gary and I both see the world as plus some, um, we don't think 
that someone else's success means less success for us. We don't have that zero sum mentality. We try to espouse that within the partnership. I think the people we've been able to attract who want to be here have that. Um, and we've tried to orient the org toward not a bunch of lone wolves, which is the standard VC idea, um, but actually a wolf pack, because that's how wolves are supposed to be anyway. Um, but, but really using software to be a means to have that collaboration happen so that you aren't getting information hoarding, um, you're getting information sharing. So whether a company is doing well or poorly, and again, most com I mean, all companies have problems all of the time. What's important is that they're good at triaging the most important ones as fast as possible. And so we need a culture of information sharing because there's someone on the team who can actually help that company with that problem or someone they know who can help. And we need as much of that to flow as possible. It needs to start from us. And I think that begins with a plus sum mindset of like, like we're all economically linked within the firm, but more broadly, like we need to be looking at every opportunity as something where we can grow and learn from um, and ha have in addition to that, this, this kind of growth mindset. Um, and then also know that we are more effective as a team than, than any one of us, even Gary or I could be alone. And, and software frankly helps dictate a lot of that culture just because it is so transparent. All of our updates are seen by everyone. You can see my meeting notes. I just got off the phone with a, a reporter. My notes from the meeting are in there. They're tagged, it's all structured data. Um, you can see the companies that I talked about. You can see the trends that she's interested in. Um, like that lives there for anyone to see. And, and, and I'm like, I don't want to hoard that. Uh, I've been, I've seen environments where I'm just like, why are we hoarding this information? Like, this is not it, it, like some reporter's email address is not uh, sacred. Like, no, like, why are you hoarding this as if it's like, you're precious? Like, no, no, like we're, we're better off the more things get shared. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of this is uh, philosophy, right? In terms of like, literally, uh, you go into organizations and I've seen it, especially the older organizations and the people just their philosophy is I have my fiefdom and you're not in it. And therefore, if I let you in, then I would lose and you're going to win or you're going to take my business or, or whatever. Um, and so how do you guys kind of one fight back against that? And then also two, how do you structure the team itself in order to uh, kind of encourage the collaboration, the openness uh, and that communication that's needed to, to prevent it? Uh, I mean, we are still figuring a lot of this stuff out. We, we want to show, I, I think we very much want to lead by example and so a lot of this, I mean, we actually have an internal leaderboard, which tracks, um, very competitive, uh, which tracks uh, folio notes across the different items. And, and I make it, it's my personal goal to always be number one there. And, and Gary and I are always fighting it out. But, but I want to demonstrate to the org that like we like we expect to be using this thing as much or more than everyone here like we we this isn't a scenario where we as founders of the firm are above like leaving meeting notes like on the contrary this is actually really important because i have my own intuition we all have our own intuition that we want to be manifested in those notes and those hunches and 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 so we want to do the work we want to show that we're doing the work as well um but we are, look, I mean, we're still only a few years really into the experiment and, you know, mm -hmm. things are tracking well for sure, but it is about bringing on um, people who also fit into that culture. And, and we've really, I mean, though, I, I always go back to, um, uh, this is going to be very uh, controversial, but I always go back to, to sports metaphors for this stuff and and i do appreciate the system mindset of belichick's patriots now we'll see how they do in a post brady era but but i do appreciate the mindset of finding people regardless of of sort of talents or egos or skills that just need to be able to fit in a system and if they don't you know bye bye um but i think i think there's a way venture has been done historically and, and I think folks who have come up with that mindset uh, have not, well, we just, we haven't even had them uh, be a part of the team and be a part of the org because we just knew it's not a fit for us. Uh, we would rather find people who are expert. Uh, 
Um, so like Brett, right, has founding experience, has massive technical experience, um, just just personally fascinated with and, and pretty deep on all things crypto, did not have a background of early stage investing, maybe a couple angel investments when he joined us a few years ago. But like, that's the part that we can train up like that's the part where you just got to get your reps in. You you yeah. you be in enough deals meetings. You see enough of this stuff. You start to see the trends. That's just hours. And Gary and I put in a ton of hours doing angel investing and YC investing. And so, what we need are the raw materials of: Do you have the expertise? Do you have the like? Can you sit with a founder for thirty minutes and that founder is like, oh, holy shit, that was really valuable. If you check those boxes, we can build up the reps on the early stage side. And I mean, you know, a company like. Um, Bison Trails, uh, which is doing very well, right? That was a deal that Brett sourced in part because of the reputation he's built over the last few years in crypto. But then also the fact that he could sit with those founders who want to talk to him and say, yeah, this is real. And, 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 and source that and identify that and find that. Um, and, and I just like having, I, I, we're still early in it but having this system mentality and being able to get all the benefits of software, which is the structured data the, I mean, we have, you can find notes from the first time you met a founder three years ago and know exactly what you were thinking as well as like how you rated that interaction one to five uh, and see which of your assumptions were wrong and which ones were right. And every vote, not just the score, but also how you qualify it so that we can always be learning and letting software do the hard part of like basically remembering things and, and helping us identify trends. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, about it, it's approach. funny how software does a better job of, uh, of remembering things than the human brain, right? Yeah, no, I look and, and more importantly, it's transferable knowledge. Like I, if, um, so I don't wanna ever have to remember that I just had, actually, I don't want to ever have to remember that we had this interview. Like I do, I don't, I don't want to purge it from my brain, but I, I shouldn't need to remember it. It will live in structured data in software that will forever be searchable so that some intern in two years will have a record of it that they can search for. They don't need to slack me and be like, Hey, Alexis, you know, pop, you ever, you ever done that podcast? Um, they don't, they shouldn't. That's a waste of my time. It's a waste of their time. They should be able to run that query in uh, Folio, which is our internal software and see the entire history of that relationship and those notes and all those things. Cause it's just not worth, it's not worth remembering. And it's also inefficient because it's still locked in my brain. I don't want it locked in my brain. I want it locked into a, a broader network that anyone can search into. Yeah. Well, not so, anyone, but anyone in our, in our trust group, uh, well, in our, in our company can search. Well, so you guys are capitalist. Uh, why not license no. it to either other firms or, uh, or, or go build a whole business out of it? Uh, we've been asked that. Um, we have been asked that mostly by LPs. Uh, I don't. I don't know how. I mean, competitive firms probably wouldn't. Um, I wish they could come. Come ask. It's okay. But uh, well, one, I don't want to be in the business of, of like I. I don't want to be in the business of having cost customers for software anymore it's really nice to only build software for like a couple dozen people as opposed to hundreds of millions of people. It's so much better. And, and I know ultimately I also think that it won't work as well for other orgs unless they really build their culture for it from day one. Like I, I, and you've heard enough horror stories of larger orgs trying to implement some great software solution and there's no participation. There's no one willing to do it because they've just had so much inertia that it would take a massive cultural change to actually get the orgs to use it. But for up and coming orgs, yeah, maybe there's a business and a, and a viability there, but I don't want to be in that business. Yeah. What, uh, what's the biggest mistake that you think you've made uh, in building initialized or like the biggest lesson you learned uh, from when you started till now? Hmm. Biggest lesson learned the, Oh, Oh, that's okay. Yeah. So the, the, at the end of the day, um, because we're doing such early stage investing, the ownership sizes were something that, you know, even at the start of Modern Initialized, um, we weren't ambitious enough with what we were targeting. And we're, we're, I mean, we're leading seed rounds now. And I, I knew in my heart, I knew at the start of Initialized that we could do that, but we weren't, we, we, we didn't execute on that. Um, 
And, and I think, I think part of it was just not wanting to miss, right? Higher concentration just inevitably means you're going to have to be right more uh, because you're going to get fewer chances. But, um, but have, I wish I had that confidence at the start of it uh, or at least started, yeah, at least more confidence in that regard because we would have targeted more ownership earlier. Um, But the good news is we've, we've increased that with every fund and um, we're in a better place now, but that was the big like math lesson, especially because we knew we were doing the work. Like we knew we were providing value because our investors were, our founders were telling us like, Oh wow, you're doing like, you all are way more helpful than our lead investors. And we heard that enough times that we were just like, why are we just doing this? Why are we doing this work to help someone else? And, uh, and so that was the number one, definitely the biggest lesson. Yeah. And, and I guess, did you, that really get hit home because you saw the math play out? Like after a couple of years, you actually said, Hey, wait a second, we own way less of that do all the dilution than we wanted to, or was yep. it the conversations with the founders? Uh, it was both. We, we had an inkling over time as founders would report back, like, Hey, you know, this is more helpful than our lead investors. And then a few years out, we're like, well, wait, okay. The founders are telling us that we're doing the work and providing, you know, providing value, uh, but we're actually doing the work. And, uh, and we're not getting rewarded for it, but we could be. And why not solve that problem? So we, we solved that problem. But that was, um, that's definitely the, the, the first biggest mistake. For yeah. Sure. One of my favorite questions to ask, especially early stage investors that come from uh, the, the operator side is, uh, do you have one hilarious story early on when you met with the more institutional LPs? where you guys just walked out of a meeting you're like, well, that either didn't go well or you guys just kind of laugh about now and say like, remember no. when X happened? Don't um, say who it is. Yeah, no, I won't say who it is. Uh, we had, <sighs> I almost feel a little bad. And, and so I, I'm gonna, the, the story is actually not that great, but the macro story is one where I actually feel a little sympathetic, which is these professionals like, I mean, just default assume they're smart, competent, hardworking people. They have to look at and evaluate so many different asset classes and tech venture is still such a small part. Like, I mean, globally in terms of dollars, like we're nothing, right? But it's obviously the most exciting and the best, um, but it's, it's, it's got this black box where I can just, I can see them getting hoodwinked by people who like, I have no respect for whatsoever, just because they don't know it's a small percentage of the portfolio. So there's not that much downside. And, you know, especially on the early stage, you don't have a lot of signal, right? You don't have years worth of data. This is just a weird, very weird asset class. And, um, and so I just, I think the times when I, when we walked out of those meetings, just shaking our heads, it was usually because those investors just didn't know what real was. And, and maybe they just didn't appreciate co-founding and, you know, turning around Reddit. Uh, maybe they just didn't appreciate our track record of early stage investing. Maybe they just, maybe they just didn't get why, I mean, we were fair. I think we're still, I don't look as young now, <laughs> but, but fairly young looking uh, folks were trying to start a VC firm because they were used to seeing uh, sort of stately or older uh, folks coming in the door. I don't know. But I do, I mean, I, I remember being asked, like hammered on valuations as if this was like value investing 101. And I'm like, at the end of the day, dude, like it doesn't really matter. Like we need percentage ownership. Like this is super early stage investing. We're making up valuations most of the time anyway, because there isn't revenue. So like, I mean, come on, come on. But, but they were, I think, they were new to the asset class. One of the things somewhere along the way there we learned was to ask early, even before the intro, like what, what's your experience with venture investing? What's your experience with early stage venture investing in particular? Um, because you can run into some folks, not, I mean, these days less so, um, but certainly in, was it 11 or 12 when we were first um, talking to folks about initialized, like there were, there were plenty of folks who just had family office types, especially just had no idea what the asset class was about. Yeah. Just, you know, everything looks like a nail when you got your hammer. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to crypto. There's a lot of uh, parallels there, I think. Yes. Now, but, oh, that's, but, that's a very good point. Very, very good point. <laughs> but, uh, before we get to crypto, uh, Serena, um, there's lots of people oh, yes. who have uh, who that's got all questions. people wanted. That's all people wanted to talk about. They, 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 they're they, like Reddit, whatever. <laughs> talk I, about I always, Serena. 
I, I always laugh because uh, um, every time that uh, Polina does anything on the internet and I'm around, everyone, they say shit about her. And I'm like, wait a minute, like she's the star, right? And I yeah. feel like you, yeah. like you, so when I saw the uh, questions on Twitter, one of them was, uh, people were basically asking, you got to tell the story about wearing the dare shirt to the tennis match. Cause that's probably, that's an all time move. <laughs> I, I think it's really important to acknowledge all of the harm that the dare program, as well as the war against drugs did on a generation. And, and I just chose that day to wear that shirt to, to remind everyone of that. <laughs> that's a uh speaking of speaking of this stately venture capitalist you're uh, you're, you're getting conditioned right. i mean i <laughs> but listen you just ha uh, happen to wear the shirt no no yeah, problem to wear. total coincidence <laughs> uh another I, question this is this is uh, a polina question is uh what was it like going to the royal wedding and uh and talk about the socks i wow y'all are going in today all right <laughs> uh i mean it, 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 i was a history major Right. So I just loved, I especially loved the fact that I felt like I was like it, I was a part of history in this very historical yeah. setting. Um, you know, I, I was grateful to be there, had a great time, wore US flag socks that I made sure the camera saw as we were doing our little walk. Um, I don't know. Hopefully that was, that was just the right amount of civil disobedience, right? I I, uh, I really appreciate a number of these things that people brought up because yeah. I feel like it is Reddit in real life, right? Like, uh, like just just enough of, uh, of seriousness, yeah. but just enough of kind of the trolling and like, we just want you to know we could be disobedient if we wanted to be. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll forever be the, the sort of, uh, the, I guess on some level, always be the Reddit co-founder in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> i love it yeah. and last the uh, last serena question is uh you are married to uh probably one of if not the greatest athlete of all time hey, you can prove you, that probably nonsense have you ever beat her at anything athletic like racing to the car jumping yeah. jacks tennis yeah. anything no okay. never tennis come on be realistic <laughs> i've never no, i've literally never played tennis in my life so it's actually very very fortuitous. I didn't even think it was a real sport until we started dating. And then I was like, okay, it's a real sport. Now I actually, I love it. It is it's such an intense sport. I grew up playing team sports my whole life. Yep. And so I never appreciated solo sports and in my household, like football and basketball were the only two sports. So I was ignorant and the amount of mental and physical strength it takes to play professional tennis. I mean, it's, it's that I would say I'd put it up against like UFC boxing those two others is like the only other in terms of mental and physical extreme because you're alone you are alone mm -hmm. out there and mm -hmm. the physical exertion and then more importantly the mental exertion on top of that 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 separates the greats from everyone else is just next level um but i've never played it never gonna play it uh i'm actually if olympia if i i promised olympia if she's into it then i can be a really good like baby instructor Mm -hmm. until she gets like actually capable and then Serena will take over and you know and then yeah. I'll, I'll play a couple matches with Olympia until she's like five and then she'll wash me <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was a kid uh my mom for whatever reason took me and a couple of my brothers and said you're gonna go to this tennis camp and we played baseball football basketball right and yeah. kind of similar style yeah. And uh, I remember we made it through one day of the camp and they asked us not to come back because <laughs> halfway through the day we, well we just realized like look we're not good at this. This like takes actual skill. So instead, oh, yeah. when they hit the ball to us, let's just see who can hit it the farthest out of the, yes. the park. <laughs> yes. And I yeah. feel like that's kind of like, if you don't grow up with the skill of, you know, learning tennis, that's pretty much what everyone else does. Just hit it as hard as you can and just hope it goes somewhere near where it's supposed to. Yeah, no, that's the, that's the realness. And so definitely I would never try to play tennis against her. Um, physical, there's, she, I have some advantages based on uh, one, my height and my size, uh, as well as like those childhood sports. So like, I remember the first time I saw Serena uh, shoot a basket or, or try to, and no, no, it was, no, no! <laughs> yeah, but seriously, that is, that is God clearly being like, that's what you get for talking about your wife playing basketball. Uh, I got to talk to Gary about why this happens because this, uh, it's good. we can, we, we'll, we'll be able to edit it. 
Oh, yeah. All right. All right. I mean, but seriously, what? Anyway. Um, but yeah, she's, she's not, not good at all at basketball. So like there are things, if we were playing a game of horse, yeah, I'd wash her or one-on-one, but like, this is not, it's not fair because you would not take, I don't know, you would not put a formula, the the best formula one race car on a demolition derby track and expect it to do well. And like, so yeah, so there are some things where I, and it's actually, it's especially nice because I get to feel like I beat an Olympian, which I'm deluding myself entirely, right? It's, it's nonsense, but in that moment, it feels nice. And it, it's also quite humanizing for her too. Um, I, I think, I mean, she's obviously amazing. Uh, the, the, the reality is her moments of normalcy only make her moments of greatness even more impressive. Like she's still a klutz. She's still, her baking's actually gotten really good recently. If you've seen the cinema roll updates, like she's still terrible at, at shooting a free throw. And those things actually make all the other stuff even more exceptional. Um, and it's also a good reminder that like all of us are, are with our flaws. Uh, and, um, but nonetheless, I mean, yeah, no, she's the goat. So I don't want to hear any of this. I don't want to hear this. This one of, this. <laughs> I will, uh, I will defend that one in my day. Uh, I love it. Brother. I love it. Um, you've, uh, you, you guys have obviously made a ton of investments um, across a whole spectrum of, uh, of trends and, and uh, industries. What specifically are you guys looking at right now as uh, whether it's kind of coming out of the COVID crisis stuff or just before we went into this, this is the thing that, uh, that you guys are interested in. Uh, I, it's going to look prophetic, but it's not, we, we ended up, I mean, companies like Roe and Truepill in telehealth are, are, doing very well and poised to continue to do so um, in, in the wake of this. And excuse me, it's not a, um, I think it is, that is one industry that I think is, is going to be very good for business as well as for society. Because what people are realizing is that at a minimum, they can get great, uh, they can gr- get a great form of healthcare on demand for, you know, nothing uh thanks to this technology thanks to smartphones and at a minimum that helps reduce yeah and i'd be remiss if we didn't talk about crypto during all this man i obviously you know we were early investors in coinbase that that has done well uh, tell me about that deal what, what you found it through y combinator yeah and and actually this is i mean this is like initialized lore so um you know and we were basing this gary to his credit was was early in dabbling in bitcoin um, I would just see it talked about all the time on Reddit. And I was like, all right, well, if enough people on Reddit are engaged and interested in talking about it, there's at least this early adopter signal, which is powerful, especially for something as technological as cryptocurrency. And um, we, we, we basically, and I remember <laughs> there's an email exchange where we were like, oh, this valuation is a little steep. Um, but thankfully, we were just like, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's just if this if this is right, this will create such a new economy, and and they will be like the premier bank for the West of of crypto. Like that's it's valuable. Um, but the part that's initialized lore was, and I forget. I think Bitcoin had jumped to maybe like four or five dollars, and they were running out of working capital. Coinbase was every morning by like nine a.m. just because they had so many people on the platform. And, and Brian and Gary were having one of their sort of regular like coaching sessions slash lunch sessions like every month. And Brian was like, yeah, this is my problem. And Gary was like, that is a good problem to have. We can help. And so we gave them uh, a round of funding to help sort of bridge them to the series a, which I think USV ended up doing. And you know, that, that investment alone was incredibly valuable for the firm. Um, even more so than the initial check because we basically doubled down when we saw that there was real, real demand here and um, you know, it's, it's done well for us. And so we've been thoughtful um, about it. We didn't get caught up in any of the ICO craze nonsense, uh, which was good. Um, really just treated every crypto investment as like a Delaware C Corp. And, um, and really we're looking for the same product things that we look for in any company. And, and a lot of it was around infrastructure, um, whether it was like Coin Tracker uh, for helping with crypto taxes, 
Um, Bison Trails, which obviously was the sort of most recent investment uh, about running secure infrastructure on multiple blockchains. Um, well, I guess Atomic technically loans. Atomic Loans is the most recent, uh, which we did together, um, which like is an economy of lending that just couldn't even have been conceived of uh, some five years ago. And, and what's exciting now is that there are enough sort of incumbents in the space, uh, especially on the mining side with Bitcoin, that like there's clear economic need here and lets you software to, to fill it. And so we're still, I, I, I don't know when it's time to call crypto spring because I keep talking about it. And I just want, like, I, I think the winter was so important to get rid of the charlatans and uh, not all of them, but be able to get rid of a lot of them and get people refocused on solving real problems and, and actually help bringing this into the mainstream. The part that still confounds me is that even during these times of volatility where the markets don't make sense and the printing machine goes brr, uh, I, how does one actually say that? Because I just know the meme and I just read the text, but I don't actually. So, so you ready? I, yeah. uh, I don't know if this is correct, but I yeah. literally walk around now. Whenever I see a headline, I just go brr, Oh, that makes more <laughs> sense than my burr like it's cold. I, I, listen, I don't know if it's right, but I just, for whatever reason, decided that's what I'm going to yeah. say. <laughs> no, that, well, I, because I don't know what a money, I realize I don't know what a money, money printing machine actually sounds like, but it probably sounds more I. like that one. The, I can't do that. I don't have, the, <laughs> I don't have the, the, the dexterity of that one. But like that, it still, it confounds me because uh, I still, I mean, I'm still long. I still hold uh, Bitcoin some Ethereum and, and some other, uh, God damn it. You know really? why the, the video just went out because they don't want to hear about anything the Fed. about Bitcoin. <laughs> the Fed is angry at me. I, I actually think this might've overheated. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna, I got a new plan. I got a new plan. Uh, let me get my, I'm gonna crank up the AC in here. All right. Uh, oh, poor baby. You running hot. All right. <laughs> I've got some serious feedback though for uh, Gary Tan when we talk about this setup. I don't know how he keeps it. He probably he probably has a nice temperature in his home. Got that 90 degrees South Florida weather and I was trying to keep okay. How bad is this background noise? Now that the AC is gone. Oh. Well, you see, I should have done this from the start. Okay. Um but I keep I keep waiting for um, Bitcoin to, to surge again because it feels like the, this can't, I mean, I think it's important. I do think it's really important we're making these cash infusions and I wish they got, they got two Americans and the small businesses that needed it, not like say airlines. But, uh, but I just can't help but feel like this will just further expedite the growth and acceptance of cryptocurrency broadly but but especially bitcoin and the, the trick is like is it now too much of a just kind of investment uh or has the infrastructure not been built yet to make mm -hmm. it really seamless to spend 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 it as easily as like usd but i'm still like the the we're still making investments on the infrastructure side we just announced brett was the lead partner on the series a for uh, horizon uh which is uh it's ethereum backed um, but they're building the game technology for digital assets like a playing card in a video game that you actually own right this is this was so appealing to me as someone who grew up playing magic as well as spellfire the D, &D knockoff of magic um and then eventually hearthstone and then looking at the fact that like i spend all this money on digital goods that i don't actually own like this just makes sense for a generation of gamers who are spending real money now if if we were in world of warcraft going on eBay to buy or sell characters or, or actually buy gold from gold farmers overseas. Remember that? And then having them meet us in the digital world to arrange the drop off. If that was happening a decade ago, then there's clear, right? If there's, if there's that level of contraband and um, sort of illegal black market happening, then, then surely if you bring it into a frictionless, like great market environment, it's going to thrive. And that's the bet there with Skyweaver, at least is their proof of concept for Horizon. But I, I really believe this infrastructure is getting built now and has been built for the last few years by highly technical product-minded founders who are thinking about user experience, who are thinking about building things people actually want. 
and now it'll be another five, really. It'll be another <laughs> five years as we watch the fruits of that get built um, and scale, which will be exciting. Yeah. Uh, it, really? Really? You good? I mean, I, you know, I really trusted you, Sony. I trusted you to make a product that would not die. Uh, okay. So, so on, on the crypto side, uh, yeah. obviously you guys, uh, Reddit has announced or, or rumored oh. uh, the ERC-20 yeah, what are, token. What are these what rumors, I'll, eh? Well, here, here's what I'll say is uh, I probably more than most understand there's certain things you can say you can't say, et cetera. Maybe just talk about yeah. kind of crypto within the Reddit system, why something other than Bitcoin, was Bitcoin ever considered? You know, just kind of whatever you're comfortable saying there. So I, I have to unfortunately keep very mum about this. Um, what I can say is the thing, you know, we, we had had, Reddit the company had had some forays into crypto and some of your Twitter people had remarked on this. When I came back in 14 as executive chair, there were some forays into it, but it was mostly still research. Um, we had much more pressing things to handle at that point. Um, much more pressing things. And, and like, for instance, we didn't have a mobile team or plan or anything. Like it was more important in 2014 that Reddit have a mobile app and a mobile website and that we were building towards that, for instance. Um, but uh, I have always believed the long-term value of Reddit is not going to come from traditional, from advertising. It will come from the fact that we've already done the hardest part. We have managed to build a platform that handles tens of thousands of communities and hundreds of millions of users who truly have a sense of community and belonging with one another. And we know, and a lot of this was inadvertent, frankly, like we didn't have a grand vision in 05 to do this, but we, we watched it happen and I had a front row seat as we were like, I was the first community manager for our first 10 communities. I would just post links under different usernames and, and moderate uh, submissions so that everyone stayed on sort of task and subject. And we've watched, whether it's digital goods and gaming, right? I wanna buy a skin so I look nice for myself and for my friends and for strangers, right? There's no, I mean, there's a small tribe there of like people you know and then people you'll randomly sort of shoot and walk away from in the video game. Um, but on Reddit, people are people will buy pizzas for strangers. People have such a much stronger tribal spirit and community spirit that if you could take the best lessons learned from digital goods and gaming, uh, things like tipping on Twitch or Patreon, and provide uh, a very seamless digital transaction for that, it will happen. It will happen a lot. And like even awards, the first version of Reddit awards I modeled after uh, the awards at the end of GoldenEye, where you'd have some that made sense, and then you'd have these other, these like random like RCP90 award. I forget there were some yeah. random, and like we didn't really have. I don't even know if we ever looked it up. Uh, we would have used Hotbot. I don't know. We wouldn't have Googled it back then. But like, we we liked. I mean, as gamers, we really liked this idea of oh, you get this award if you do certain good things over the course of a day, and that was just V1, and that was like 2006. So before any of this award stuff, gamification, any of that stuff was a thing, we did it just because we were copying GoldenEye. And what I wish we had done was double down on it back then, because what we're already seeing now, even with small modest improvements to awards, is that users love giving them to one another. They love subreddits, communities love creating them. It, it reinforces this tribalism. And the more that we can do to help communities and users um, strengthen their relationships to one another and make money in a way that they're happy with, like the more we win. And, and it, it just seems like a logical transition then if we know, I just gave you the horizon experience with Skyweaver, right? If we know this stuff works where you don't have any ownership whatsoever, and it's a massive industry and growing, it reasons, it reasons to be that, if you allow for a kind of ownership and, and a kind of decentralization to it, that people would do it even more because they could feel all the feels we get when we, you know, take a cup and say, Hey, do you want this cup? Here you go. Um, so, and then and me not, not have this cup anymore, of course. And so I, I wish I could tell you more about it. I love the fact that there is this much energy here 
Yeah. And, and I do think long term, a big part of my job on the board, especially right now, while, you know, Reddit's traffic, like every UGC site is booming, um, we can reasonably all expect marketing dollars to soften. And, and so now is the time for companies like Reddit to double down on revenue streams that are like this, that are accretive, that are things that build on community dynamics that actually add value to everyone involved and, and, and eschew the sort of traditional models of marketing um, or at least, you know, remove our reliance on them uh, as a business. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, there's a lot of questions about, uh, you know, you kind of have this great journey to where you sit today. Uh, but early on, you know, it was like, hey, look, we want to start a company. Uh, we kind of have an idea. Oh, that idea sucks. Yeah. Okay, like, here's another one, right? <laughs> yeah. um, what's your advice right now to college kids or, or kind of kids coming out of high school, especially given the macro economy, the, the virus and around, mm -hmm. you know, what skills should they be developing and kind of how should they be thinking about their careers, um, you know, over the next two, three years. Sure. I, I mean, I, I realize a lot of people watching this are like, this guy, this guy's married to Serena Williams. This guy co-founded Reddit and initialized. Really? Really? First investor in Coinbase? What? And, and I get that. And I appreciate that. And I want, I want you to take away from that, that, uh, there is very little that one can plan for in life. And so, my guiding principle would be, I actually was supposed to do a graduation speech that I think is moving digitally now. So this is, this is a good kind of beta test for it. Um, focus on the things you can control and, and, and work as hard as you can to improve on those things, get better at those things, uh, and then spend as little time as you can dwelling on the things you can't. Uh, and that's sort of a general kind of COVID economic macro situation there. But but in particular, if there are things that you love doing that don't feel like work, but are viable things in a new economy, um, do more of them. Really, really focus on those things um, because that is the best path to a, a great career. One that gives you fulfillment, whether or not that ends up being, you know, fabulous riches is not as important as like having the fulfillment of a job that is not going to get automated away. And that will give you satisfaction and, and provide for, you know, hopefully a family or even just for yourself. Um, that's the stuff I would focus on. And I think there will be a generation of high school students that will now think twice or their parents will also think twice about taking on the student loan debt of uh, going to a lot of universities. I don't, I don't think the top tier schools will have as much to worry about because there's still so much credentialism and network and brand and whatnot. But there's a lot of schools um, that don't, this is going to sound terrible, but don't have a really unique value proposition that don't have a clearly articulated value for the very, very expensive tuition and the crushing inescapable student loan debt it would give that, that I hope we can learn from what I think were well-intentioned mistakes, encouraging everyone to go to college as a path up and instead say, all right, Let's have a critical, serious look at what you enjoy doing, what you want to do, um, and consider an option that just makes the most sense. And so, like, I've, I've tweeted about this, and one of your folks asked about it. I would love to see a, a reimagining of trade schools, mm -hmm. a kind of – I think part of it's rebranding it, just simply, like, having a, a kind of um, – you know, we, we were – early investors in general assembly, which was one of the early kind, not quite coding boot camp, but type of sort of like a community college 2.0 with very modern skills being taught by actual practitioners, some version and, and beautifully branded and just felt very premium. What is the general assembly of skilled labor? Um, what is the version of that for welders of these professions that we know are in tremendous demand where the average age of the people doing it is I think in the fifties, maybe like upper 40s but this is a generation that's getting ready to retire with with no real replacement but for jobs that are still desperately needed and even in a time of increased automation there are so many tasks that just won't be autom auto automated away easily because of all the physical and mental complexity and creativity required to solve them and and that's the fact that like building a robot that can come in to this office and go figure out what's wrong with my toilet is really, really hard. It's really hard. 
and and for for the foreseeable future at least as i believe it plumbers will not get replaced the welders will not get replaced there will be software and systems to make their jobs less repetitive right they they just like we do at initialized we're going to automate away the things that require memory like extreme memory or planning or scheduling like the things that humans just suck at and don't get fulfillment from anyway and let them focus on the parts that are creative that are physical and sort of very specific um that are valuable and and so i think i think we need to tell a generation of kids look if you're going to end up just being a history major at the university of blah because you want to spend four years you know going to college because that's the thing to do reconsider it and and if you like working with your hands or if you have um if you have interests and passions outside of like the sort of general like oh yeah i want to go to college to have fun and party um there should be way more affordable paths to getting a really valuable education even in the new economy and then the like the cheat code which is the thing i mean i went to 82 universities when my book came out in 2013 82 universities across the US and Canada telling people if you're at all interested cuz you're already in college now like if you're at all interested in learning to code do it please like like just take the class even if you don't like it great you are exposed to it that is the cheat code for the new economy if you want the like it is not i guess unlike a cheat code it is not easy to accomplish it takes work uh, it is not a trivial skill to learn, let alone to master, but like, please, like that is a path into a kind of job security that is, if you enjoy it, incredibly fulfilling, both spiritually as well as financially. Um, and, and now that has expanded beyond engineering to product design. Um, we're seeing even amidst all the layoffs right now in, for instance, the Bay area, um, so much of this talent is getting scooped up by the folks who are sitting at the table with a bunch of chips who, who have the cash and now have an opportunity to hire even more great talent. And so, you know, I, it's, unfortunately it is not as simple as saying like, do what you love. Like that's, that's just irrational. I don't think great advice. Um, but putting more of a point on it, if there are things you really enjoy doing where you can lose hours working on them and they don't feel like work, um, and they fit those criteria that we just talked about where it's the kind of work that's not going to get automated away. Like that is probably a really good path for you to keep going down. And, uh, and I think remote learning, all this stuff is going to see a huge bump coming out of this, uh, overall. Yeah. I, I've got a friend actually, he, uh, he started buying up, uh, and kind of rolling up, uh, electric, uh, electricians simply because he said, not only no. are uh, electricians not going to get automated away, he goes, the schools are so bad that we're actually churning out less of them and therefore uh. they'll become more valuable you know, over the next five, yeah. 10, 15 years. So if I, if I manage to fund trade school 2.0, then I'm actually hurting your buddy. He'll be fine. Trust All me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he, he will be just fine. <laughs> but we need, we, we, we so need this. And, yeah. and I think one of the good byproducts of the, the isolationism that I think we'll see in the next five to 10 years is it will recreate or it'll resurrect a self-reliance culture which I do think is a good thing. And I think with that will come more scrutiny on, oh yeah, look at all this infrastructure we've let go to waste here in the greatest country on earth, right? And that will, that will reshift the mindset around a lot of these trades. That will, that will change some of the broader culture around it and help do, the, help do part of the work. But we still need that reinvention of the actual education programs, to your point. Um, but I do think that's a silver lining. I, I, it it does hurt my heart that we will see such a big shift inward in the next five to 10 years. Cause I really do. I'm the child of an immigrant. Uh, my mom was technically undocumented for three years cause she overstayed her visa, which is how most undocumented immigrants get into the country. BT dub. Um, you know, she overstayed her visa for a few years and thankfully ice didn't toss her out. Um, and she married my dad and voila, I'm here. But like, it, it does hurt my heart because I really do appreciate so much that we gain from this open flow of information and ideas and humans. I, I like our food in America would be pretty whack as if England is any indication, 
Uh, right, England benefited, the UK benefited tremendously from a, a flow of immigrants who really leveled up the cuisine there. Um, like if nothing else, my fellow Americans, you should appreciate immigration for the fact that it has made our food so great here in America. And, um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a part of me that definitely it's going to sting to see this closeness that I think we're undeniably going to be heading toward the next five, 10 years. Um, I hope we can make up enough of that with things digitally. I mean, right. I think this will also ironically then give rise to more and more of these decentralized type networks that can, thanks to, you know, in, in most countries uh, that can transcend uh, sort of national blocks. Um, but uh, look, I just want, I want to see the best ideas win. And I know that the best ideas don't all come from the United States. And I know that opportunity is not universally distributed, even in our own country. And I just want better things. And so that's the, that's the sting of it. But I do think one of the silver linings of that self-reliance will, will actually make us stronger as a country. I love it. Uh, three questions to, uh, to wrap up with, and you could ask me one uh, to end it. Uh, okay. Ask are, me anything. You, you are a new dad. What is the, uh, the one thing that uh, you either enjoy or have learned that you did not expect uh, before you became a dad? Well, you've got to listen to my podcast, Business Dad. Season one <laughs> is out now. No, uh, the biggest thing that I've learned, it put into perspective how, <laughs> how I don't see how horribly I lived my life before I found out I was going to be a dad. But like at 34, 35, I found out I was going to be a dad. And, and I just, it, it was perspective building, man. I really, I wanted to get better. I wanted to be better about the things that I ate, the things that I drank, the things that I smoked, the amount of exercise I did, the, the just taking care of myself by even seeing a doctor. Like I, I felt a new appreciation for my own mortality and a semi disgust at how little I cared and how much I lived for myself up until that point. Um, and, and so I, I know in so many ways it has made me a better person because I now evaluate everything through that and, and through that legacy and through that role model that I'm providing to her. And I'm still, still messing up all the time, but as a North star, it has been so much more fulfilling than, I mean, I felt, I felt really great about starting Reddit. I felt really great about all the work we've done with Initialize. Like there's so many ways that we keep score in business that are all kind of made up, but they're good. We're competitive people. We need that stimulation, right? But it put all of it into such a perspective where I was like, this is this little person. She, she matters more than any of this other stuff. This family unit matters so much. And, and I think it has helped me. It's definitely made me a better man. And I wish I could say just meeting and, uh, marrying my wife did that and that helped it absolutely did but not even it's just a very different level and I, i'm sure she would say the same thing like yeah meeting you alexis marrying you alexis was great but the thing that really changes everything was 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 having olympia so i um i'm not encouraging everyone to go out and make babies right now though there there will definitely be some quarantine kids by december uh that's for sure but but i do i i i'm i'm so grateful for the opportunity to be her dad uh, it's, yeah. it's awesome that, that, that's awesome. And I think people can you know, see it, right? And just uh, kind of the way that you act and, and things you say and stuff. So I think it's really cool. I mean, I still do dumb stuff. Let's be clear. Like, and that's the other thing too. I, I also get really self-conscious about the fact that I am not a perfect dad. Like, and I don't, I, we, we all have, myself included, we all have stories that we present to the world. And I should just post more photos of Olympia being sad. She's not as cute. Of course, because she's uh, she makes a face though that's kind of cute because she's like eh, and her face gets really flat, and it's her sad crying face and it's 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 adorable. But um, right, I hope I hope the takeaway can be and I should do a better job of this with the pod too. I hope the takeaway is like, look, this is a work in progress, and I I just even from talking to all these different other business dads, the best the the common thread between all of them is is they're all very accepting of the fact that they're just trying to figure it out too. Mm -hmm. And, and they're picking and choosing and learning and adapting. And, and, you know, we're, we're screwing up all the time, just like in our startups, we're just hoping the trajectory is up and to the right uh, with our children too. I love that. I love that. What, uh, what's your favorite book ever other than the one you wrote? My favorite book ever. Okay. The controversial one that I, I really, 
I enjoyed a lot more than I thought I would was um, a winner, Winners Take All, which is not my favorite book of all time at all. But um, I really, of the books that I've read in the last like year, I really appreciated that one for giving me a dose and a perspective that I think I rarely get. And I want, I, I, and I don't know how this is going to turn out because I know I'm sort of responsible for this with Reddit, but social media has done an amazing job letting us find our tribes as well as discover new tribes we didn't even know we had. And I think overall, that is amazing, right? We get to learn about crypto together with people from all over the world who humble us and teach us and all that. That's awesome. Um, it also means it's easier than ever. And this is like version two of like the filter bubble that they were talking about years ago. It makes it easier than ever for us to then isolate ourselves and not want to be subjected to ideas that make us angry or, or at least uh, challenge our worldviews. And then there's a fine line there. Cause I think there are some ideas where it's perfectly reasonable to be like, that's a terrible idea. Like that's a bad thing. Um, but, but there's always this nuance that I worry will get lost as we get better and better at finding our tribes. And so I try to make an effort to find and read things that challenge it. I don't do a great job of it, but I do from time to time find that. And, you know, when I think of, when I think of like a universal thing, like book that I actually would recommend to anyone, um, you know, one of my favorites, uh, my, one of my favorites might be this book drive about human motivation and incentive. Um, just because it's guided a lot of the ways that I think about product as well as community, which are the things that everyone seems to ask me about when it's about investing or startup advice and, um, human incentive is still something that we don't fully understand and maybe we never will. Um, but I am just, I'm awed by it because, on the one hand, it, sometimes it's very rational. Other times it is incredibly irrational. Um, but there is actually some reason to the irrational stuff. And I think all the times that I have had success as an investor, especially at early stage, really just comes from paying attention to these trends and, and being a better observer than like prognosticator. Like I don't think we're particularly good at predicting the future um, and I don't, th I certainly know we can't do it in a bubble. Um, but if you can get really good at identifying trends and looking for signal amidst a lot of noise and, you know, reading Reddit every day for a decade and a half has helped, um, you can find it. And I mean, that's the, the magic right now is COVID has exposed the strength of the fifth estate where, um, so Thomas Carl, I was a history major, right? Right. He talks about the fourth estate as media being a check against the three estates, the three branches of government, both government and the media showed a failure to really prepare us for COVID-19. And, and those are the two institutions that historically like balance each other out and have all sort of the, the, the trust of the nation in one, one pocket or another. But, but it was the fifth estate social media that actually really was ahead of this. I mean, that's, that's the reason I like, I, I felt like Cassandra talking to investors or portfolio founders in January, some of whom right didn't really believe the advice because they were trusting one of those other estates and just like, no, 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 it's not a big deal. And, and that's only because I followed the right people on Twitter. It's only because I followed the right people. And I had a couple of partners at the firm who are also tuned in, but, what does this new world look like as the fifth estate gets stronger and stronger? And as individuals, you all are, each one of you are developing your own media brands. And, and, and I don't know what the accounting of that is going to be, but there's real value in being able to show being right early in a way that like, you know, a hundred years ago, it was subscriber counts of a newspaper. What does that look like now? I don't think it's necessarily YouTube followers. Um, perhaps there is a great blockchain based way to, to, to show this. I don't know, but, um, I'm excited for it. I'm also clueless as to how it's going to turn out because as humans, we just, I mean, this is a little sapiens, so I know I'm doing the VC thing, but like, we just really don't have a context biologically for this much data. Like our tribes were really, so they were the people we could walk around or walk to for a long time. 
And, and we only got mass communication, what, the last 100 years, travel, uh, 50 years. Like, we're still figuring this stuff out. And now we can go online and I can see what someone had for breakfast in Seoul. I can, I can see real-time images for how, uh, you know, they're handling COVID in Mumbai. I can see opinions from literally all over the world in real time. And I think Paul was prescient when he said there's, there needs to be a front page of the internet. I think Reddit has now built multiple front pages for the multiple internets, the sort of multiple tribes. Um, but I wouldn't say that that is the accounting of the internet. Um, what is that going to be? Because the answer for that is going to, I think, be really valuable in years to come. Um, because especially if you're in the business of trying to make money or trying to understand where the future is headed, like it is going to be really valuable to know where that signal is. And uh, I don't know how that's going to play out. But Sp Speaking of uh, humans, third question, are you a believer in aliens? Think they're real? Uh, I think it is possible. Like, are you asking me, do I think that they've visited? Not or, visited, just, no, just yeah. out there. Oh, I think if the, if the universe is infinite, then, which I believe, uh, then I think that it is plausible that there is alien life. Uh, it might not be impressive. Again, I mean, you're asking a tech guy this question, but like, I, I don't think it could be, I think it could be like a, um, you know, a single celled organism, but it's still an alien. Um, do I think it's like a xenomorph from alien? Uh, hopefully not, but maybe. Um, but I, so I, so I guess the real answer is, I don't know, but I could imagine. So yes. Yeah. Uh, I think. The, the thing that's terrifying though, right. Is if they can, we've now explored enough of our galaxy that if they can get here, then their shit is going to be magic relative to what we can comprehend. And so at this point, I'd rather not find out unless we're the ones visiting them. I think that's the best way to look at it is, uh, at least here on Earth, the people who usually invade some other place are usually end up being the victor. Right? right? Now, let me check this out, right? I wish, and there might still be a chance, but I really wish COVID-19 would be our like Independence Day moment as a world because this virus doesn't care about any of us. It mm -hmm. does not care about how much money you make or your race or your gender. It doesn't care about anything. It just wants to make you sick and make other people sick. Um, I really hoped it could be the Independence Day moment. I'm looking for the Jeff Goldblum and Will Smith to uh, save us uh, or some way help us put aside our differences and unify. And we're seeing it in pockets. Uh, but maybe, you know, the special effects budget of COVID-19 is just not great. So it's not very compelling. You don't get to see giant spaceships hovering over massive cities, but I wish we could think that way. I really do, because I hate COVID nineteen. It it, uh, it Not sucks. A fan. It, it sucks. sucks is, is a great way to put it. What, uh, yeah. what one question you have for me to uh, to finish this up? What what made you want to invest in Atomic Loans? <laughs> um. I'm just a big believer and I've gotten over this a couple of times. So like the whole idea of you've got sound money in Bitcoin uh, or at least the properties of sound money, uh, but all of the infrastructure for the most part uh, is centralized around it. Um, so whether it's the Coinbase's, the Gemini's, the BlockFi's, et cetera, some of it were invested in some of it were not. Uh, if you look in the like ether uh, Ethereum world, you get uh, what they're trying to make money, like ETH is money meme and, and they're, they're trying to do it. But the infrastructure is decentralized. So like you almost get like decentralized sound money that has centralized infrastructure, but then you get decentralized infrastructure with something that looks kind of like a fiat currency to some degree yeah. with ETH. Yeah. And so you got to bring those two decentralized components together, the money and the infrastructure. The big question is, do you bring Bitcoin to the ETH world or do you bring DeFi to the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem? Um, and uh, I tend to think you're going to bring the infrastructure to Bitcoin rather yep. than bring Bitcoin to, uh, to ETH. Uh, highly controversial. I've had a million people come on and, you know, bitch and complain and basically say that, you know, I'm an idiot and all stuff, but that's just kind of my general thought process. And then, uh, ended up, uh, you know, you guys were investing, um, and, uh, made sense. Right on. Well, excellent. I'm glad, glad to be cooking with you in the kitchen on that. Absolutely. Where, uh, where, where do you want people to go? to find out more about you or initialize. You can follow me on the Twitter. 
at Stuff, Alexis yeah. Ohanian um, or Instagram if you're into that. I assume Twitter is going to be the move for for your crowd. And then they should go to initialize.com, obviously, if they want to learn more about the firm. Um, that's it. I don't have a SoundCloud. Not yet. <laughs> Awesome, man. Listen, I appreciate you doing this. It's a ton of fun. I, yeah. I know uh, a lot of people wanted to uh, to kind of hear what you guys are up to, and uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, obviously, anybody Thank who's starting you, a company man. should uh, should go check you guys out and, uh, and and convince you to give them some money, like uh, like Atomic Loans and many others. Right on. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Sorry we couldn't do this in person, but you know, so it goes. C- COVID sucks. Yeah, COVID sucks. <laughs> Hashtag COVID sucks. All right, thanks, man. Likewise.